Well, good morning, Venture. It is great to see everybody today. Glad to have those of you who are joining us online. It's good to see good crowd here for our first service. I don't know if that 12.30 tip-off had anything to do with that or not, but uh, maybe it did. But we're glad that you're here, glad that we can be together and worship together. And I, I want to encourage you, we do have great opportunities. What JC said about the church, not just being a church that gathers in this building, but a church that serves across our community. And in a couple of weeks that weekend, it's actually two venture serve days, but an opportunity for us to go serve out in the community. And, and I really want to encourage you to sign up, to be a part of it, to jump in, because we have a responsibility as a church. We, we feel a commitment as a church that God has called us, he's blessed us in so many ways, and God calls his church to be salt and light in the community. And part of being salt is you teach people truth, that, that salt function of it, but specifically when Jesus said light, he says, shine your light in a way that they see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. And so we get this privilege of shining in the community through good works. And through that, hopefully people see that and they give God glory for it. And so one of the things I, I love about Venture, we, we get a lot of privileges because we're a big church, but we have a lot of responsibilities that when we want to shine light, we're called to shine it in a big way. And so that's why our team, when, when we look at these days with it, we're always looking at going, man, how much can we really do? And, and we're always pushing, feeling that responsibility. Man, we got to shine the light in a big way so that when people come to a Linda Vista Elementary and they see what's been transformed there, or when they come to, to Teen Challenge, they see the work that's there, they go, who did this and why did they do that? And we're able to point them, hey, we did this as the church because we are the hands and feet of Christ and this is what he called us to do. And our goal with it is that they would give God glory or maybe take a next step of considering God or considering Jesus in a way that they wouldn't have. And that happens significantly when you do it in a big way. When you mobilize 900 people on the same weekend, you can do something that people have to notice. Guys, we wanna be the kind of church that if we disappeared tomorrow, our community around us would be so sad we were gone because of the impact they were feeling and the impact is the body of Christ around us. And so to do that, we, we've got to mobilize, we've got to sign up. Any of us can take a four hour shift over the course of a weekend. And I promise you this, having done all these serve days in it, you will never end one of those four hour time periods and go, man, that was a waste of time. I don't know about you, I can look back over a course of a weekend and look at some four hour blocks that I go, oh, that probably was a waste of time. This will not be one of them. You'll be so glad that you're a part of it. It's so energizing. You can get out there with your kids. You can serve in different ways. But here's what we need right now. Venture, you're pretty good about showing up. I'll, I'll just say that. You guys show up. You're terrible about signing up. You really are. You're just terrible about it. I, I don't know what it is. It's like, like night before always with that. And, and on a lot of events, we can handle that. Like, okay, they're going to show up. This one, we have all these people, they're coordinating projects and painting and it just takes a lot of work. So they need you to sign up now so they can get you placed in the right places. So if we could go ahead and just mobilize now, let's start signing up. Let's do this together so that as a church, we have the opportunity to shine the light in the community in a way that over at the end of that weekend, somebody would look at it and they go, why did they do that? And we get to point to Jesus and give him all the glory. Hey, will you pray with me? Let, let's just pray even now of the impact of what we wanna see accomplished that weekend. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege of being able to serve you. Thank you that you've blessed us. Thank you that we have resources. Thank you that we have people. Thank you that the, uh, this church is just filled with people who love doing this. Lord, I, I thank you for the different people that we have that are so skilled, ones that lead construction companies, ones who, who take their time in order to be able to, to organize this, to mobilize this, to make sure that we do this effectively. We have so many that sacrifice in that. And Lord, we're praying now that we could shine light that weekend in a way that will bring you great glory. We're praying that somebody would see it 
And maybe they've been far from you and they'd at least turn and look to you again and realize that you're a God who loves and you love through your church in tangible ways. Lord, we, we lift this before you. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. Well, hey, this weekend, if you're new with us or maybe you missed last week, we're doing a short series, and I think it's one of the most fundamental series we do in the church. So much so that I would encourage you, if you missed last weekend and you didn't hear the message, go back and listen to it. Go online and listen to it. Because we're, we're laying out what is fundamental to what does it mean to be a follower of Christ here at Venture. We've called it the Venture Way, but really what we're trying to do is follow the direction of Jesus. And so we talked about it last week. Jesus is not only the way to God, but he reveals the way of God. He's not only this path to God, he also shows us what does God in flesh look like? And and so when you look at his life and you imitate him and you learn to follow him, that's what he told his disciples. It was the core command more than anything else. It's what he told us. He says, hey, just follow me. And and we look in this, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the father except through me. And so so this way of to God is also the way of God. And so we, as a church said, okay, what does that way look like? How do we teach someone? If someone said, hey, what does it mean to be a part of venture? What am I supposed to be doing around this place? What does it mean to follow Jesus? And, and we can get into either ruts or patterns or in a few things that we're really maybe great at that come easy to us. Or we can get into just bad habits and different parts of it. And so part of what we did is we stepped back and said, okay, the venture way is how we follow Jesus through these seven core practices. And, and we talked about them and we're gonna keep teaching through them. Engage in God, receive teaching, worship daily, live in community, serve others, give generously and share the way. And last week I just taught on how do we engage God? And, and by the way, each of these could be classes, could be series. And so when we talk about teaching these and doing this, this is the short series where we kind of lay it out. But in the future, we're gonna keep coming back to this and offering a class, maybe an online class, doing different sermon series around each of these things because it's so important that we develop it. And and last week, I I just gave you a simple way to put into practice of how do you start reading the Bible every day and praying to God and, and taught the SOAP method where you have a scripture and you observe it, apply it, and then you pray. And, and a lot of us have been going through, gave you Psalm one through seven this week. I don't know about you guys, if you've been tracking along with it. I got in the middle of the week and, and so many of the Psalms were speaking directly to my day and what I was feeling and going with. There's a part of me who's like, God, did you set this whole thing up because you knew I needed this passage this week? And I've heard that from some of you. And it speaks to the fact it's living word. This is what we talked about. This living word that the Holy Spirit uses in our life as we engage him every day. Now, here's what I wanna encourage you though. Under each of these, what we're trying to learn is some simple habits that you can develop. Remember, I, I talked to you about habits and how they shape your life. Gretchen Rubin, who's, who's done study on it, habits are the invisible architecture of your life. It's the invisible architecture. And so the more you put a habit in place, it's something you no longer have to think about. And you no longer have to apply willpower to. A lot of you are sitting there going, man, I wish I was a person that did that. I just don't have willpower. Actually, if you'll force yourself to use whatever willpower you have to to develop simple habits, at some point when it becomes a habit, it doesn't take willpower anymore. It doesn't take this thing that I go, oh, I gotta make myself to do it because I put patterns in my brain in a way that this now becomes part of the invisible architecture of my life. So here's what I wanna encourage you. If you did a week of soaping, you did a week in Psalm and maybe it's the first consistent week you've done, keep it up. The more you do that, it will move from the day where you go from getting up in the morning, okay, I need to do that, to getting up in the morning and it becomes a part of your life and you no longer have to spend that willpower on it. What we wanna do on each of these is is not only learn them, but how do we apply them? And so today I wanna look at a couple of them. Look at this second one, receive teaching, receive teaching. 
And when I say that, teaching has always been an essential part of following Jesus. If you go back and look through scripture, teaching is always a part of that. And so the the teaching that's in, in the word, the apostles, the early church in Acts 2, they devoted themselves. That word devoted mean, man, we are really committed to this. This isn't something we just kind of do every so often. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, doing life and community together, the breaking of bread, taking communion and having meals together, and prayer. There was a devotion to that. So you see that engaging God in parts, but you also see teaching was so fundamental. Now you gotta remember back then they didn't have our New Testament. Those books weren't even written. And and so the teaching of the apostles was so fundamental in the church. The apostles had a fundamental role because they had been with Jesus for the three years. They had sat at his feet. They had learned. They had watched the miracles. And so the apostles came and what they would do is take what we call the Old Testament scriptures. They would take those parts of it and they'd go, all right, let me show you how Jesus was a part of this plan of God all along. And they started connecting the dots for him. And so the church came together because they're all learning together, how do we follow Jesus? And so the stories about Jesus started circulating. Let me tell you about this miracle. Let me tell you what he taught this day. And then those apostles or those under those direction, they then directed the writing of the gospel so that we would have those same stories. And and we could talk about it. And then others would write letters. They would write different parts to the church so that we would have an authoritative truth to teach off of. So so teaching is is fundamental to it. Now, maybe you're here and you you go, Tim, I've been to church some in my life. Maybe church is new for you. Maybe you've not been real connected to it so far. And one of the core issues, and you hear it from people, they go, I I just don't, I don't get the teaching part of it. It just kind of doesn't really do anything for me. Or it's really boring. Now, if it's really boring, some of that may be my fault. I, I, I work hard on it. There's, there's also a part of it, and I'll just say this. We never take, it's not like any other teaching. Just like I said, the Bible's not like any other book. There's a part of the teaching that there's very much a spiritual element to it. And so until you have a relationship with Christ, that's why we always call people back to the gospel. That's why in every message, I'm always wanting you to know, man, if you've not had a personal relationship with Jesus, you haven't started that part of the journey. So much of this will not connect because you have to have the Holy Spirit in you who's opening his word in a way that that it connects with you. Look how Paul puts it in Corinthians. He says, we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit. He's talking about this teaching we do is not just human wisdom. Interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. In other words, those who have this relationship with Christ, that spiritual part of them is alive because of it. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are folly to him and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So a natural person, a person who doesn't have that relationship, they they don't have the Holy Spirit within them. Paul just says, hey, let's be honest. So much of what we teach, so much of what we believe in the Bible, they look at it and they go, "That, that feels like foolishness to me. Why would you live your life that way? Why would you deny yourself that way? Why would you pattern your life? I mean, after a book that was written 2000 years ago, the world's changed in so many ways. And maybe you feel that way and kind of look at it and go, yeah, this is kind of my core problem with it. As I I, I look, I just can't embrace that. And and here's what I would encourage you. I'm not going to teach you into it. it. It really does come back to, unless you have that relationship with Christ, so much of this will feel like foolishness in ways. But I would tell you this, and I don't know how to explain it exactly in words. Boy, when you have that relationship with Christ, you start realizing, oh, this stuff that seems so strange is so applicable to my life. It actually is not restrictive, it's free. It's actually not repressive and judgmental. It's gracious and life-giving. And that's what we want you to experience in him. And that's why we come together so that we can understand that and experience that life-giving. 
To do that, God set up the church in a way, look, he said there's some people he gave to the church. He gave apostles, that first generation of those who walked with Jesus, and so they told us exactly what Jesus did. The prophets, these would be the people who had the miraculous ability, they could speak this truth. And and so before the New Testament was written, prophets were very important in a church because you didn't have a New Testament Bible you turned to. So the prophet would speak, hey, here's the truth of God that you need to know. Evangelists, these are people who are gifted in sharing the good news so that people can understand it and embrace it. And then shepherds and teachers, those who are shepherding the flock, those who are guiding the flock and those who, who are gifted as teachers in it. Now, these aren't offices in the church that he's describing here. These are gifts to the church. We, we have other passages to describe the offices, but in those gifts, look what the shepherd and teacher and all of them are, are called to do, but especially now for those of us who are shepherd and teachers, we're called to equip the saints. We're called to those who equip those who are following Jesus so that they can do their work of ministry. You've got a work of ministry God's called you to do every day. And so we're called to equip you to do that. For the building up of the body until we all attain. And so here's what teaching is supposed to lead us to, a unity of the faith. We should be more unified because of what we're being taught and led in. The knowledge of the son of God. I mean, if we're gonna follow the way, we need to know the way. And so we need to know him better. A mature manhood to the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ so that we look like Jesus in our lives. So that we're no longer children. Now here's the reality. When you start your relationship with Christ, you're a child and you think like a child. And he's not saying that in a derogatory way any more than we look at children derogatory and go, I can't believe they're children. Well, of course you're supposed to be children, but we also expect them to grow. And he says, "If, if, if you don't have this ministry, this teaching in their lives, look what happens. You end up tossed to and fro by waves about every wind of doctrine, every new truth that comes through, every new interpretation that comes through, you're vulnerable to it because you're a child. And he says, no, you you need someone teaching. Human cunning. He says, humans are always coming up with something. And at the end of the day, craftiness in deceitful schemes. Who is behind deceitful schemes? Satan. Satan's always behind it. So he says, you're always gonna have this swirling out there. You got this new doctrine that came out. You got this new human thought on this subject that's the newest of all things. And then you've got an enemy who loves nothing more than scheme all the time to trick people because he hates you and he doesn't want you to experience life. And Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And so I've given to my church people to to lay out my word in a way that you could experience and know that more and grow up in that. As we do that, we recognize that receiving teaching, and, and this is why we chose the word receive teaching. We didn't just say teaching, receive teaching is more than just consuming. It implies teachability and accountability. There's, there's two sides of this equation. There's an accountability that I have as a teacher and especially as the the lead pastor teacher in this church, huge accountability that comes with that. When Paul was writing pastors, look what he writes. He says, as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Titus was one of his mentees. He was the mentor trainer. Titus was a pastor and he says, hey, Titus, here's what you've got to do. You have to teach that sound doctrine because remember that new wind of doctrine is going to be coming through all the time. And so you have to teach what is true to what God's revealed. He says the same thing to another one of his pastors that he trained, Timothy. He says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So you, you've got to rightly handle it. You've got to cut it straight is actually what the term there. It's like a carpentry term. You, you can't just you know, get the saw and just go any direction you want. You have to cut it straight right down the line. You've got to rightly handle this. It, so much so, look what James says in this. He says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. He's talking about when you stand before God, there's an accountability for all of us who teach 
that if we stand up here and think about it, I'm standing up here, I'm opening God's book, this living book, and I'm telling you guys, hey, this is what it means. This is what God's teaching. And so anytime I go through any passage like this and, and I'm teaching and any of us who teach God's word, James says, hey, you might not wanna be so eager to jump and do that because there's an accountability you have before God that you spoke for him. And so you have to answer to him. And so that's why you, you can't just get up here and oh man, put together kind of a couple of cute phrases and this will preach and, and what feels good. That's why Paul says, man, at the core of it, you gotta go back to, are you presenting the truth? Are you presenting what the Bible said? Is this accurate to it? That, that accountability that comes. And, and that's what I'd say, especially within a church, there's an accountability. Any of us who teach, any of us who teach out there, whether it's on the radio, in, in any setting, anybody that's opening God's word, they have that accountability. It even goes further, that accountability, when you're shepherding a group. Look what Hebrews says. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls. They have this responsibility over the souls of the people they lead as those who will have to give an account. And so that's why, especially a pastor in a setting, it's not just the teaching, it's also you have to give an account for the people. And the weight of that. Now, notice in this, it's a two-way street. The, the writer of Hebrews says, obey your leaders, submit to them. And, and this is a word, no one likes this word. Everybody wants it out of the Bible in all the different contexts. Anytime you see submit, it's always based on delegated authority. Can I, can I just say that? It's always based on God has given authority. It always goes back to him ultimately. He's the only true authority. And so this submission to your leaders here, it's not because your leaders are so great, so powerful and just do what we say. He's saying, no, they have a delegated authority of opening God's word and leading out of that. And so the, the authority that we have comes from God and it comes from his word and presenting that. But it does mean for each person, there's, a, there's an accountability that I have to God, but there's a teachability that you're supposed to have when you come in this setting. That it's not just an evaluation based on, hmm, I don't know if I like that or not. But we, we come with the heart of a teachable heart, open to that. Uh, I love how he puts it too. He's talking about, he says, let the leaders do this with joy and not with groaning. In other words, don't make their life miserable all the time. Why? Because that's no advantage for you. It doesn't help you. I, I, I always feel convicted in that because teachability, I think, is one of those things that keep you growing over a lifetime. It just does. And it's easy for any of us. You can kind of reach this point where you've kind of arrived. You know, I mean, at this point in my life, I, I've grown up in the church and sat under, I don't know how many thousands of sermons and went to seminary and all that part. And kind of reach that part. You've heard the whole Bible preached in, in some context or every topic. And so you kind of come in anytime you're sitting under somebody and you, you kind of get that, hmm, I wonder what they're gonna do with it. And every time you, you have that attitude, it's like God always convicts me and goes, oh, you're not teachable today, huh? You can't learn from them. Because it do, doesn't matter the person, it matters the word that they're opening. That's where the power comes because they had delegated authority. I remember about 20 years ago, um, I went down to Dallas Seminary. I graduated from Dallas Seminary and worked at the Leadership Center and I went down to do a, a leadership conference all day at, at DTS. And they invited me to come back and they said, hey, would you come and train some of the local pastors and some of the things you guys are doing at your church? And so I went back and you know, I'd worked and prepared this whole seminar and, and planned on, you know, I'll have a lot of young seminarians or young pastors there. And I get there and I'm kind of in the seminar room and I look over and, and in the corner, I see Mel Summerall. And Mel was one of the founders of Denton Bible Church. He's probably in his late sixties at this point. Had done amazing things, unbelievable. Had, had found and brought Tommy Nelson and that church had grown. I mean, all the different parts that happened with it. I mean, he's just one of these guys I respected so much. So I kind of went over to him and I was like, hey Mel, good to see you. Um, what are you doing at the center today? He said, oh, I signed up for the seminar. I'm like, my seminar? <laughs> and one of the things Mel always did, he was always discipling a bunch of guys. He goes, oh yeah, I got four of my guys with me. 
And so I kind of went, okay, maybe he wants these young guys to come and hear. Okay. And, and, and I stand up and I start teaching and Mel sits on the front row. And literally everything I said, he's writing it down like he's never heard it in his life. I mean, feverishly writing. And then every so often he would go, he'd do this. Oh man, that is so good. And I'm like literally looking at him thinking, no, it's not. It's really not that good, Mel. You've forgotten more than I know. But here's what hit me. That's why God used him. Because he never stopped being teachable. He didn't walk in and go, what's this young punk gonna teach me? He went in and go, man, I, I wanna keep learning because I've got this heart to grow in that. Now, as I say that, some of you go, well, Tim, are we just supposed to take everything you say at face value then? No, here's what I'd say. Evaluate and accept teaching based on the truth and not how it makes you feel. You gotta evaluate and accept it based on the truth, not how it makes you feel. And so one of the things, I, I love the passage in Acts 17 when Paul was going around and, and he was teaching, the group in Berea, when, when they came and taught him, Paul and Cyrus, they taught in Berea and when they arrived, they went to the synagogue. These were Jews more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. So they were very teachable, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. It's a great filter there, very teachable, but they would pull out their scriptures and go, okay, is what they're teaching match what, what scriptures say? See, that's that combination. You always wanna go back and go, okay, how does this match with the Bible? But it's based on the Bible, not how you feel. And, and I'd say that very clearly because it's easy to evaluate, oh, I don't really like this teaching because I don't like how it makes me feel. Or I don't think God is that way. Sometimes I'll, I'll have people and they go, well, what you taught, that just can't, it can't be true. And, and I'll ask them, okay, based on what? Well, based on it just can't be. Okay, but beyond your thinking it can't be, can you give me a scripture? Can you give me something? Give me something that would show that's not true. See, it's easy, and this, this what Paul says to Timothy, he says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but will have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. We are in this time, folks. Where, where and, and Paul just says, hey, Timothy, you just keep teaching the word, keep teaching sound truth, and just recognize that there's a lot of people, they won't like it because it doesn't match how they think God should be. And they don't like it because they don't like how it feels. Now, Carl Truman says, we've reached the age where we've made it the sovereign self, that whatever the self feels is now sovereign, as opposed to an objective sovereign God who teaches us the truth. I would encourage you as well on the final point in this consistency of both hearing and doing the word is the key to growth, consistency. So we've seen this James passage and, and we taught on it, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. For anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, it's like a person who looks at a mirror and then forget what they look like. Now, here, here's what I would say though. To be a hearer and doer, you gotta start by being a consistent hearer. And so remember, we're talking about just core practices and I would encourage you, if you've not made a core practice in your life of receiving the teaching of, if you're part of Venture, this church, if you're part of another church, whatever church you're in, you need to consistently, and here's what I mean, every week you need that teaching, every week. And, and the great news, we have technology now that even if you can't be here physically, you can always catch the message and watch it online. But, but I would challenge you, here's all I would challenge you, because it's easy to do, we, we live in the age of multitasking. And so you can kind of go, okay, yeah, I can't really make a church this week. You know, I'm gonna listen to the message and then I put the message on and I'm answering email 
and I'm also checking my phone and I'm folding laundry and doing a couple of things with that. It doesn't have the same impact because you're not giving yourself the audience in a way that the Holy Spirit can speak to your heart and life. Remember, this is a spiritual exchange, not an information exchange. And so I just would challenge you, if you don't make it a habit, if you can, one of the easiest things, make it a habit that you're here with us in person with it. But if you can't, and some of you live far away or you catch it, make it a habit when you do that, you do it in one setting and you allow yourself to really engage it. And the more you'll make it a habit, the more you don't have to use willpower about it. Some of you every weekend, you have to wrestle with willpower whether you're even gonna go to church. Because you set yourself up that way. You're kind of like, oh, I'll decide tomorrow. And you realize what you're doing every week. Ah, oh, we got to decide. Or we have to have a family discussion. Or we're going to... Do you realize the work it takes to do that? That if you'd move it to habit, if you'd move it just to habit, go, we just do this. You don't ever have to think about it anymore. We just do it. Your kids don't think about it anymore. They know we do it. We've taught that in their lives. And I know some of you go, Tim, well, uh, this feeling a little bit, you know, legalistic. Are we getting back to where you got to be in church to be a good Christian? No, I, I'm not. I, I've been around enough legalism in my life. But I, I would say this, we've gone the other extreme. And, and we're so scared of that and we've given such freedom around it that we don't actually call people to just develop healthy habits of the heart and life. You do this in other areas of your life. I bet you're very legalistic about brushing your teeth. I bet you are. Or, or legalistic about washing your clothes. I mean, if somebody came up to you and go, oh, you're all legalistically making me wash my clothes. You, know, you, you got your way of doing things. I mean, at some point you look at them and go, no, I'm not being legalistic, but you stink. <laughs> you just literally stink. So you just need to know that. And, and I would just say this, I'm not trying to turn this into legalism, but if we don't practice these things, I just, and lovingly, let me just tell you, you start stinking. You just do. And so the more you put this as a foundation in your life, I don't have to think about it. I don't have to use willpower toward it. It just becomes fundamental to what I do. L let me flip with that, because with teaching, a core part is worship. As a worship, we choose every day to make God the object of our worship. We choose every day. God is the center of my worship. This is why God, his first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And, and here's why I say you choose to make him the object of your worship. Everybody worships something, whether they know it or not. And if you worship anything but God, that God will eat you alive. It just happens every time. So God, who's the center of life and love, said, if you'll make your life around me, then your life now is centered on life and love and truth and the way. So we choose to, to worship him. As we do that, worship is the embracing the truth of who God is and treasuring him above all things. So you say, what is worship? It's embracing the truth of who he is. That's the first part of worship. Second part of it is then treasuring him. We, we have expressions, anybody you treasure, anybody you cherish, anybody you love, you have expressions of that. But it has to be who they really are. And so when we say embracing the truth, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Jesus was talking to this Samaritan woman and the Samaritans had some strange parts to their worship. They didn't worship in Jerusalem. They had parts of the law that they followed. So she asked Jesus, she says, who's right in our worship? Us or, the, or, or you Jews? And Jesus says, you gotta worship in spirit and truth. And then she sa he, he says directly to her, you guys aren't worshiping right. You, you just aren't. And the core of it is, you've not fully embraced the truth of who God is. And so your worship has gotten off as a result of it. And, and I would just say this in our worship and as I've dove into this one, I'm gonna move through it fast because we need to do a worship series. There's so much around worship that's so important and I wanna teach on this. There's a lot of people that would say they worship God, but they are worshiping the God of their creation, not the God of who he really is. And it fundamentally changes everything. 
That's why Jesus said at a fundamental level, it has to start with truth. As you worship in truth, otherwise you're doing what Romans one says, therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts to impurity, dishonoring their bodies among themselves. Why? Because at the core level, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Do you see what Paul's saying? And if you read through Romans 1 and all the implications of Romans 1 and you look at our culture today and all the implications of our culture today, the core issue started with worship. When we place ourselves as the center of worship, you're open to anything. Paul said they exchanged the truth about God. All of our worship starts with this truth about God and then we look for those ways. How do we treasure him in that? How do we treasure and express that truth? And so one of the important ways of expression is praising him together as a church. That's why we've come together and we sing. And singing is fundamental. I mean, you look through scripture, Psalm 96, sing to the Lord a new song, sing. Over and over in these Psalms, they sing. As a people, they would sing. They would travel to Jerusalem for the festivals. And on the way, these Psalms were a part of it and everybody sang on the road. You sang together. You sang as an expression of worship. Paul says, hey, one of the fundamental parts of you know that God's got a hold of your life is singing starts becoming a part of it. You go, really? Yeah, look, Colossians 3. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In other words, when the Bible is really penetrating your life, man, when you're embracing that and receiving that teaching, You'll express it through teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. So teaching's gotta be a part. Look what he says right hand in hand with it. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Singing is such a core part of when the Bible and that truth is penetrating, it expresses itself in it. When you're walking in the spirit, he says, don't get drunk with wine, that's debauchery, but be filled with the spirit, addressing one another. How do you know when you're living a spirit-filled life? You address in one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So you, you, you ask, are you filled with the spirit? Paul would go, well, let me ask you, do you sing? Do you express it through song? So that, that's why when we come together and think about it, there's not many contexts where groups of people get together and sing. I mean, honestly, it may be at a concert with the oldies, you know, when it's the oldies band and you know the words to every song and everybody sings along, that's why you're there. Or sometimes every so often a sporting event, you know, sweet Caroline, bum, 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 everybody jumps in with it, you know, we all sing. Otherwise, where do people gather to sing? You ever wonder why do we do this? I had a friend, he's, he's, he's not a believer, um, uh, I love being around him because sometimes he'll come to church. We talk a little bit. One time he came to the service, I asked him, I said, what did you think about the service? And he goes, hey, you know, I really like the group karaoke time. <laughs> you know, y'all put the words up there and we all sing along with it. He goes, yeah, that's kind of fun. I go, yeah, it, it's a different, why do we do this? Because collectively we know these truths about God and he's asked us, to sing them, to express them. There's something about singing that forces you to get outside yourself. It, it forces you, 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 you gotta move out of that kind of evaluation mode to actually engagement mode. And, and let me be honest, I'm gonna meddle a little bit here. A lot of you never sing. You never sing, you, you're like, well, no, I am in my heart. I, I don't think Paul said in the heart. He said, you actually, you actually sing and you do that. And especially for guys, it's usually not our thing. A lot of guys, you're kind of like, eh, I feel self-conscious. I don't like doing it. I, here's all I know. I, I can't keep reading through commands over and over. And God says, this is something you're supposed to express and do. And it's not based on our voices. Not all of us have the voices to be up here. Uh, trust me, I don't. Anytime I'm up here and there's singing going on and I'm singing along, I, like I talk to the mic guy and I like, you have make sure my microphone is cut out. I will kill this song. We cannot have that. <laughs> but we're called to engage because we treasure God and it forces us outside of ourselves together. You go, sometimes I don't even feel like it though, Tim. That's probably when you need to sing the most. 
I'm always convicted when Paul and Silas were in prison in chains. They were praying and singing hymns to God. And look at this line. And the other prisoners were listening to them. They're in prison in shackles. And they sing. They express it to God. Surely if they can in this context, surely as the people of God, we could do this in this context. That we would allow ourselves to just get outside of ourselves. And I'm declaring together the truths about God I know to be true as an expression of of treasuring him. Worship, one last thing with worship. Your greatest worship is giving yourself to him every day as a living sacrifice. This is your greatest worship. As much as I love singing and I think it should be an expression, worship's not reduced. That's one way that we worship. Your daily worship and and remember the phrase here is worship daily. Your daily worship is what you give to God. That's why Romans 12 says, I appeal to you brothers by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Your worship is when you take you every day, a living sacrifice, you place you on the altar. You you place your day on the altar. You place your work. You know where you worship the most is at work. That's where you worship the most. And I'm not saying you're sitting at your desk singing. You'll get fired doing that. I mean, I work at a church and I don't want the people sitting at their desk singing all day. So it's more than singing. It is actually the work you do. When you work hard for God, it's such a beautiful expression of worship that you lay on the altar and you go, God, this is yours. When you invest in your family and your home and your marriage, it's not because you're getting a great marriage out of it and oh, it's so wonderful. That's the side effect. You do it as an act of worship to your God. You go, I give you this. Give you this as a sacrifice. You know, when the people came to the temple to give him a sacrifice, everybody gave. Not everybody could give the same sacrifice. Some were really poor and all they could give is maybe a bird as a sacrifice, but it was their best. Some would give another animal. If you had the means, you you gave a lamb. That was your sacrifice. And it was the best you could have. It was unblemished. And see, I always think of this in this act of worship. What kind of sacrifice am I giving to God every day? Am I giving him my best? So I do my best at work. I do my best at what I do. See, when you start thinking of life in that way, it changes how you approach everything. So how do we put these practices in practice? Let me give you just a few things. Take your notes with you, put them in your Bible because all of these things, engaging God. I I want you, if you did the the seven chapters, let's do it again. Let's do eight through 14 this week. And here's why. If you'll keep doing it, it'll become a habit and then you don't have to think about it anymore. And if you haven't been doing, jump in. That's why I chose Psalms. You can jump in any Psalm you're not behind. You're not like, oh, I missed last week. I don't know what's going on. You'll know what's going on. Just jump in and do so. Do that method with it. Receive teaching. Here's what I would ask you to do. Would you commit to consistently hear the teaching of venture every week? Would you just make a commitment in your heart? You go, you know what? This is a weekly habit for me. And so I will either be here or I will join them online Or I will carve out the time that if I missed it, I'm gonna sit and listen to that teaching and actually engage it. And and then ask God to help you not only receive it, but apply it. Man, how do I apply this truth? And, And then worship, it's a simple thing. Here's what I would ask you to do. At the start of every day, I've been doing it, it's amazing. Before you get out of bed, before you grab your phone, before you brush your teeth, before you do anything else, would you just stop And just be with God just for a moment. And here's what I picture. I go, God, I'm giving you today as a living sacrifice. You get get this whole day. You get me today. And I I picture putting me on the altar. Sometimes I think about, okay, this is what I have today. Here's the meetings I have. Here's what I need to do. I'm putting all that on the altar right at the start of the day because I want this day to be an act of worship to you. And then at the end of the day, when you go to bed, just examine the offering. Just look through it and go, man, did, did I really give God, did I give him my best? Did I give him what he called me to? 
And it's this great way of reframing your mind at the beginning of the day. It's also a great way to look back on the day and there's parts of it, sometimes I go, oh God, I really, man, that was a waste and I confess that to him. Other times I go, God, you showed up in ways I couldn't have fathomed. But it gives me a worship point in connection. Hey, let, let's take a moment. I, I'm gonna bow us in prayer and then the team's gonna come back out because we wanna finish. We've been talking about worship. We wanna finish out with some worship today. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you that in all these things, you've not only called us to it, but you've empowered us. We can worship you because you've revealed yourself to us. We can know truth because you've given us truth. We can serve you because you showed us what service looks like. Lord, I, I pray, would you energize us through this? I, I don't wanna turn all these practices into some just legalistic way that we check off boxes and that we, we evaluate ourselves and others. That's never what it's called to be. But I would pray, would you help us develop the healthy practices that Jesus, you modeled and you taught so that we could experience you more and know your truth more and worship you more. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen.